Ever since The Walking Dead Season 2's release, I've always had a fondness of its menu, specifically the dioramas. It's such a cool way to hint at things to come, and while the game was being developed, the community would discuss what they thought would happen next in the upcoming episodes. As I've mentioned before, the fourth side amid the ruins has always been my favourite. It's always stood out amongst the rest. Everything about it just comes across as really strange and creepy. It's a cool aesthetic that I kind of wish would have been explored more. But something else has also stood out about this slide to me. And that's Eddie. Eddie, if you don't remember, was Wyatt's buddy from 400 Days. Who either determinately leaves Wyatt behind after being attacked by Nate, or left behind by Wyatt who also gets attacked by Nate. Wyatt will only join Tavia if Wyatt left behind Eddie, or if Eddie left Wyatt behind, Tavia needs to mention that friends or family could be at their camp. I personally believe that leaving Eddie behind is the canon choice, but I'll explain why later. So let's talk about him. Why is Eddie just strangely on the cover of this light? What's his purpose? Well, this is where my theory comes in. Let me make it clear that this has never been confirmed or debunked. Everything I'm going to tell you is pure speculation, nothing more. But I also want to remind people of how to think about this video. You see, with my last theory video, I made the claim that the ending to season 4 would have Clementine return back to her home in Atlanta, coming full circle. There were a lot of people who thought it was ridiculous, remarking how difficult it would be for Clementine to get home, and what advantage it would be for her to go home in the first place. And they're right, the idea itself is kinda silly. But that's the problem. People disagreed with the premise, therefore they considered my theory to be incorrect, simply because they didn't like the idea. But as we know, it turns out I was correct. The actual ending to the game was completely different, but that's because they changed it later in development. As far as I'm concerned, it doesn't matter. The point was, people didn't want to believe it to be true, even if it was. So I want you to keep that in mind. You should approach this from the mindset of, could this possibly have happened and is it likely, and not, well, I don't like the idea so no, it probably isn't. But you get the point. So. What's this theory? Well, I need to get something straight first. We need to discuss the Amid the Ruins slide in more detail. So let's analyse it, shall we? What we see is Clementine putting blood on her face, presumably to move through a herd. But if that's the case, then why does it look like she's preparing for battle? The way the camera's position makes it clear that this was intentional, or at the very least meant to be vague. In fact, a lot of people thought it was supposed to be war paint because of how bright red it is, but the earlier versions of this slide make it clear it's supposed to be zombie blood. I'm not sure why they made it look like face paint, but that's not really the point. On this slide we can see a bunch of silhouettes. It's much too dark that we can't see them properly. However, if we brighten them up, we can see that they resemble characters that we know are dead. We see Carly on the right, Eddie very clearly visible without the need to be brightened up, a hooded up bandit, Vince, and then also Doug. Okay, so what is the point of this? What is this slide trying to tell us exactly? Well, let's think about it. Clearly, the silhouettes are not meant to be the actual people that they represent. Doug and Carly ain't coming back. Okay, so why are they there then? Because they're meant to represent characters that we know aren't dead. This is confirmed by the fact that they changed Vince's hair to closely resemble Kenny's hair. Why else would they make that change? From what we can see, it appears as though the Carly figure is meant to resemble either Jane or possibly Sarita. The bandit is clearly supposed to be Ralph. 
Remember, these slides are based on an older version of the story. This is proven by the fact that Troy is depicted as Carver on the second slide, and even has animations associating him as Carver. The Vince looking silhouette is meant to be Kenny, obviously, and the Doug character is likely meant to be Luke. I'm sure people will mention the fact that Luke was supposed to be wearing a hat originally, so how could it be Luke? Well, Kenny also wears a hat, but that's absent from this slide as well. But didn't I miss someone? No, I'm not talking about Eddie. I'm talking about the person in the back. In the PC unified version of the slide, Clementine is actually covering up this character, so we have to use the PS3 diorama to actually see them. I'm really not sure who they are, or who they're supposed to represent, or even if they're male or female. Something I noticed while re-examining the slides is that in the beta slide, Doug and Carly are level with the other shadows. In the final version, they tower over the others. Adding on to this, the character in the back was also supposed to be closer to the group than in the final version. You also notice that Eddie is quite bunched up with the bandit character. This slide is really one hell of a mystery, isn't it? Take note of the fact that while the characters were moved around and Vince's hair changed to represent Kenny more closely, one thing didn't change. Eddie. He was always visible and never shrouded in the dark. Not one thing changed about his appearance. So why is he on this slide? We know he isn't in the episode, so why is he here? Well, as I said before, these slides are meant to represent an earlier version of the story. And it's my belief that Eddie was supposed to play Arvo's role. I'm sure some people might say, but isn't he a placeholder like the others? I don't think I have to point out how obvious it is that the silhouettes in the background are placeholders. That's obvious. But Eddie is not a silhouette. He is clearly visible. Right there. In front of you. But okay, he's next to placeholders, so it's really not that unreasonable people could see him as being a placeholder. But there's two huge things that destroy that theory. One of which is his hood. In 400 days, Eddie's wearing a leather jacket that does not have a hood attached whatsoever. So why would they randomly decide to alter his model specifically for this light? Why not just turn him pitch black and put him in the background like everyone else? Likely because he's supposed to play an important role in the story. And who else is there that has a hoodie and is also an important character in this episode's story? Arvo. But that's not all. Closer inspection at both Eddie in 400 Days and Eddie on this slide reveals another change to his model. The blood. Look where the blood is located on Eddie in 400 Days. It's mostly off to the side on the left cuff of his jacket. But look on the slide and you can clearly see most of it is on the top of his shirt and neck. So we now have two alterations to his model. I'm sure some people might say, well, maybe he was supposed to represent Arvo. Keep in mind what I said before about Troy originally being Carver. Also, Telltale actually changed the background of episode 3 a few times. If they could update the background for that, why not do it for Amid the Ruins? But that's enough about the menu. Let's actually talk about the episode itself now. As we know, when Jane and Clem are on the observation deck, Arvo shows up and begins stuffing the drugs into the trash can. Now, think about this for a second. Why would Arvo do something so stupid? Isn't it a bit more believable that a doofus like Eddie would hide it somewhere like that? That's forgetting the fact that Arvo's camp is covered in snow, 
and is almost a day's walk away. It would have made more sense for him just to bury it in the snow nearby the stash house, but that was retconned in episode 5. As we know, episode 5 was going to take place in the town across the river. When this episode released, that was still the plan. Listen to what Jane says here. There's some buildings across the river. I think I can see a church. The nearest river crossing is miles up. Rebecca wouldn't make it in her condition. That implies that it's still quite a walk away. So the situation is still the same. It's quite a difficult trek, right? So it still doesn't make much sense, given Arvo's condition, for him to walk all this way across a river just to hide drugs. But what really stands out is when Jane says this. Look at all of it! Clementine, we need people that stuff! People are suffering just as much as yours! You are not special! Clementine, yes, you must We don't believe, believe a fucking word about your sick Please sister. Please don't make my sister suffer. She has been through enough. Oh, yeah? Well, I think you're just some junkie. You know what that word means, oh, huh? Oh, no, I'm, I'm telling the truth. Junkie? Why the hell would she say that? Arvo is a handicapped, frail guy with broken glasses. Isn't it a bit more believable a guy like that would probably be using medicine to help himself? Eddie, on the other hand, got separated from Wyatt because of a drug deal gone wrong and is a self-admitted drug user. Oh my god, really? But is there any weed? So your argument might be, well, if they swapped out Eddie for Arvo, why did they keep that line? That is a very good question. Here's the answer. Perspective about what you think is awful, but you also get perspective about what you might not be able to uh, see as not working or... Right. Or it's just not making sense. Usually a, a lot of times we will have content that is, you know, was more important at a different time in the story. And some scenes are, are oftentimes containing what I would call relics of, of importance to things that aren't, normal, aren't in the story anymore. And you oftentimes people will look at and say, I don't know why this is here. And you're like, well, this was here because it used to be more important that this character is here or this character says this or what, what have you. And, you know. There's further proof of these relic voice lines still in the game. Do you remember when Luke mentions Mike? Hey Luke. Hey Clem. So, uh, I heard Mike saved you bacon today. Yeah, he's a good guy. Yeah, I'm sure he is. He thinks we don't like him. No, it's not that. I just think he's more eager than he has a right to be. Okay, he wants acceptance before he's earned it. Does that make sense to you? I guess so. Like, dude, what the fuck are you even talking about? Mike helped us escape, killed the zombies, helped carry supplies back to the camp, and hasn't done a single thing wrong. So far. What do you even mean by eager for acceptance? What the hell does he have to do to earn our trust? Why would Luke say something so weird like that? Oh, that's right because Mike was actually Ralph, a bandit in the woods that attacked Clementine and Krista. And the reason he's trying so hard is because he's trying to atone for his misdeeds. When you think of it like that, now the line actually makes sense. I mentioned earlier that I felt as though the leaving Eddie behind choice in 400 days was the canon choice. The reason I think this is because for whatever reason, in episode three, the game actually tracks this choice. You might say, well, isn't that just used to check if Wyatt came to house? Well, as I said before, it doesn't matter if you left Eddie behind or not. So long as Tavia mentions the family or friends line, Wyatt will come. So there's no reason for this choice to be tracked. Well, one theory is that Eddie could have been mentioned by Wyatt in an earlier version of episode 3. But I also see there being another reason. The revolver that Arvo uses at the observation deck is the exact same gun that Eddie uses in Wyatt's chapter. This is the only time this same gun appears after Wyatt's story. Almost as if Eddie was still meant to have it. 
Obviously, if Wyatt decides to leave the car, then he takes the gun. But this is telltale. Eddie would still be using the same gun even if he didn't leave the car. Because this is telltale. These are the types of mistakes they make all the time. Look no further than the very end of this episode when they randomly switch the Russians in the gunfight. It's why I think Eddie leaving the car is canon, and why Arvo uses a revolver. Finally, the last bit of evidence I have is more subtle, and that's the music. Does it sound familiar? It should, because it's from 400 Days, and it plays in both the trailer and also when Vince makes the choice to shoot off someone's foot. So, okay, I've said quite a lot. Now that we understand the reasons and full context of everything I've presented so far, let's try to summarise it all. Eddie's model in the Amid the Ruins slide has been altered. He was given a hood, and the blood on his shirt is also different. Arvo, a physically and visually impaired man, gets called a junkie by Jane. I don't have to explain why that makes no sense. The walk from the town to the observation deck is still quite a trek, and given Arvo's limp, it is impractical for him to do. Eddie owns the same gun that Arvo uses in the episode. This is the only time this gun appears after 400 Days. And finally, a song from 400 Days plays, during the choice to take Arvo's meds. So, there we have it. Regardless of whether or not you're convinced of what I have to say, you have to admit that there's quite a bit of evidence to support it, and that there's also still many unanswered questions about the Amid the Ruins slide. But also let me say this. When I say that Arvo's role was originally Eddie's, I'm not saying that Eddie would have done exactly everything that Arvo did. I highly doubt Russians would ever have been involved. Telltale's games have gone through so many story changes that it's just practically impossible to make sense of what they were going to do. If you've seen any of my videos, you should know that. But I do have a rough idea of what I think was supposed to happen. I want to make it clear that this point onwards is basically fan fiction. I don't have any hard evidence that this is how it would have played out, but like I said at the beginning of the video, Think about it from the viewpoint of, does this make sense? Okay? What I think, and what should have happened, is that Eddie would end up joining Clementine's group. The reason I say this is just given his proximity on the slide, since he's amongst all the other shadows, and as I've said already, the shadows are meant to represent people that we already know, so it's really not that far-fetched he would have joined our group. But I also won't rule out that he might have been taken hostage by Clementine's group. Maybe they couldn't let him go because they were worried he might warn another group about their presence. Jane makes that very point when Arvo first shows up. Perhaps it was supposed to play out similar to the way it does in episode 5. Instead of Arvo promising to show them where the supplies are, Eddie could have been in a very similar situation he would then lead them towards the town, and on the way there, Carver's remaining crew would have showed up. Things would become tense, until Wyatt recognises Eddie. Then it becomes a situation where neither group wants the other to shoot. But at the same time, members of Carver's group are still angry over what happened. Maybe Wyatt and Eddie are trying to convince each other to put the weapons down, and Maybe things begin to calm, until someone fires a shot and all hell breaks loose. Maybe it was out of malice, maybe it was an accident, either way, it ends the same way as it does in the final game. Not only would the fight have actual stakes this time, but it would make the 400 Days characters have some actual presence in the story. 
Now, doesn't that sound like a much more compelling scenario to you? Compare that to what happens in the final game. Look at the result. Nobody besides Luke and Mike were injured. That's the extent of the outcome. Forgetting how utterly ridiculous it is that they're firing at each other point blank, the Russian scenario is just not interesting. Now, I don't have any real proof or tangible evidence to support my story, but don't you think it's weird that they spent all this money on making new models for the 400 Days characters? Like, just think about the logistics for a second. They had to organise and pay six voice actors for one line. There's absolutely no way that's all they did. There was clearly meant to be more to them, right? Well, whether or not you think what I just told you is what would have happened, let me ask you something else. Does this story make less sense to you than, let's say, a few random Russian people who can't speak a word of English yet have lived in post-apocalyptic America for two years? Like, just think about this. Where exactly did they get their weapons and ammo from? That's never explained. In the 400 days scenario, this question is easily answered. House had an armory and had the tools and manpower to retrieve ammo and also make their own. How did the Russians meet each other? Arvo and his sister are obviously close, but it's implied that the other two Russians are not. But the question of how they met up is still not answered. Why are the Russians trying to negotiate when they're clearly outnumbered and outgunned? If they really wanted supplies, then why not just shoot the group? It's not like you can talk to them. Would it really not be easier just to shoot them and take their supplies anyway? In my scenario, the 400 Days group are pissed off. They want revenge. And also, they weren't outnumbered. In fact, they were probably more capable of taking out Clementine's group, considering Rebecca's condition. So I'll ask again, do you think the 400 Days gunfight that I proposed makes less sense than the Russian one? If you think that the answer to that question is yes, you're a fucking idiot. I mean, here's the thing. This theory could be complete and utter bullshit. But the reality is, the evidence, at least for me, adds up. And I already have a good track record of working on limited evidence. At the end of the day, we can only speculate what the plan was. We don't know the details or the discussions or what went on specifically at Telltale during that time. The only people who know the answer are the people who worked on the game at the time. And none of them have said a single word about it. It's honestly pretty damn strange just how much we know about Season 1, A New Frontier, and the final season. But how little we know about what went on during Season 2's development. It's especially weird considering it's the sequel to the game that made Telltale the company that they were. Well, anyway, regardless if you agree with the theory I presented or not, I at the very least hope that it made you think. And more importantly, I hope you're at least a little bit entertained by the video. I just want to assure you that I'm working on getting my Walking Dead update video out soon. It sort of expanded from just a Season 2 uh, cut content update into a multi-season cut content video update, so it's taking a bit more time. Hopefully it'll be worth it when it's done. I just wanted to say thank you for your patience and I hope to speak to you again. I'll see you soon. Goodbye.